Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another First Friday event. We hope you are all well and are staying safe and staying with your mask on. Won't be necessary this evening since we're doing it by Zoom. Now, this is only our second Zoom event, so there may be technical difficulties from time to time, and we appreciate your patience. This is a new way for us to present our First Friday events, and we're trying to do the best we can for you. And we have a wonderful program for you this evening. One thing I do want to mention is that throughout the event, if you have questions, you can type them in and we will present uh, Julie, our presenter, with uh, questions uh, towards the end of her presentation. Now, everyone will be muted. There will be no video, uh, so there will be no distractions with other folks coming in. You will just be seeing Julie and her presentation. So sit back in front of your computers, your iPads, your phones, whatever your electronic device is, and get ready to enjoy a wonderful program by Julie she is the head curator for our local treasure, Fioli. And it's an amazing place because what they try to do there is not just have it be a museum where you wander around and there are exhibits. They try to present it in a way so you understand that families live there. Um, two very famous families had the opportunity to first construct and design um, the estate and the wonderful gardens that we all enjoy who visit there. So it's, a, it's an amazing experience to understand how people live there and enjoy this wonderful estate. I, because Julie is talking about some renovation that took place, I'm, I'd like to share with you a quote from Mark Twain, because I think it's appropriate here, where he said, when your friends begin to flatter you on how young you look, it's a sure sign you're getting old. And what we have here through the hard work of Julie and many of the people who are working here at Fioli, we have something that was old that's now young again. And we couldn't do it without their efforts. So without further ado, I would like to present uh, Julie to you all. So sit back and enjoy and thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you, Tom. And thank you to the Woodside Arts and Culture Committee for having a, a, me again. It's been a few years since I've had a chance to speak with you and, and I'm happy to be hosting you tonight in the drawing room itself. I'm a little after hours just watching that beautiful evening summer sun out in the window. Um, so here in the drawing room, um, what I'm gonna do tonight with the slideshow, and then we might have a chance to walk around the room a little bit is kind of uh, go over, we've been working on this project for a few years now, and it's been um, a really great opportunity to refresh this room and really show it as, the way it was meant to be experienced uh, originally by Agnes Bourne. And, you know, Filoli was designed as a home for Mrs. Bourne. Um, it was also a home for the Roths uh, family later on, and to about 35 staff who also were raising families and living here and experiencing the house. Um, we still continue to this day to have families that live on site. Um, families of staff that have raised their children here. And so it continues to be a home even 103 years later. So I will give a chance here. I'm gonna share my screen so that you'll be able to see a presentation um, so that you can kind of see some of the photos um, of the process. Okay, switch over here. Sorry, whenever you run these things on a tablet, you only have the one screen. <laughs> so, what we've really tried to do um, throughout this multi-year project is redraw this room. Um, drawing rooms are ladies' spaces historically. They're very much intended for ladies of the house and ladies that were visiting them to spend social time together. 
And at the time of Philo's construction and early occupation, um, it was very much still a time of separation of the sexes for all of their entertainment activities. And so the, room, the name drawing room comes from the fact that ladies would be asked to withdraw from the dining room after dinner to leave the men drinking uh, you know, brandy and enjoying cigars and talking about what they would. And we were supposed to come into this room as ladies and have coffee or tea and talk about our next fundraiser event or what was happening um, with different committees that we were a part of. And so there's even a little door in this room that would allow the staff to bypass the men and serve this room directly. So everything about this room um, in the way that it was originally designed is to suit that. And this room is also a huge, huge look into the personal art collector, Agnes Bourne. So Agnes, this house is designed as a home for her. Even the blueprints say a home for Agnes Moody Bourne. Um, she had a lot of input on design decisions and on collecting furniture that would go in these 56 rooms. The house is a little over 54,000 square feet. Um, it's 54,286 square feet to be exact. And that's 56 main rooms, 10 family bedrooms, and 14 staff bedrooms. And she already had a number of other homes that she was trying to bring furniture from, that she was bringing art from, uh, to fill the rooms at Filoli. And what we really see is that the house is really a lot to do with Agnes as a collector. So I've always loved this quote. Um, it's actually from a letter that she wrote to our architect Willis Polk in London when she was there shopping in 1916. So right in the middle of construction. Um, you know, they broke ground in 15 and they moved in in 17. And she was really constantly looking for furniture and art to fill out the existing spaces. She knew that they would bring furniture with them from their house in San Francisco. But she also knew that that house at 8,000 square feet was never going to fill this house. So she had a lot of work cut out for her. This is what the room looked like if you'd visited us maybe in 2015. Um, I came to Filoli in 2011 and the room hasn't changed a lot in that period. Uh, we changed out a few pieces of furniture here and there. We would occasionally change out paintings, but the room really didn't have the same look and feel as it did historically. Part of it is that you're seeing this kind of soft gray green walls. Those were put in in 2000 um, and some of the vertical fabric paneling effect that was there originally was removed in 2000 because of some complications I'll share with you later. But it, the, the color of the room was a little, a little cool in this green as it is now. Um, we also didn't have some of the important pieces of furniture that were originally in the space. Uh, we were trying to show a music connection since historically the room kept a piano in it. So we had a harpsichord, we had a square piano, we tried to talk about Agnes as a musician herself in this space. But one of the biggest things for me is that this room's almost 35 feet long. It has 17 and a half foot ceilings. And we didn't have enough of any one art collection to be able to display on the walls that made sense as a grouping. And that was a huge feature of the original room. So here's a view of the space in 1936. Um, right about the time that Agnes and William Bourne both passed away, about six months apart here at Filoli. And a part of inventorying the house to put it on the market, uh, these beautiful photos were taken by Gabrielle Moulin's studio in San Francisco. And we also have a full inventory from this period. That's pr it's pretty close. It's pretty close to a full inventory. Occasionally it's missing things that you can kind of see that are in a photo that aren't in the inventory and um, that may have been personal items that were removed. But usually it's pretty close. Um, and in this room, it's almost down to the ashtray. Um, accurate. And so as you can sort of see, there's this salon style display of artwork that goes all the way around the room. There was 40 mezzotints, aqua tints and stipple engravings that kind of unified the space all the way around. And then there was also this furniture grouping in the middle of the room, which you don't see in these sepia colored photos. But when we get to the Roth era, we see that they're bright, vivid fuchsia sofas, um, a color very popular for Agnes and William in their furniture selections. 
And so we just, we were missing a lot of that small detail of the space um, and a lot of the color scheme we were missing. Here's another view, looking down the Western hallway, looking towards the reception room in the library at the end of the hall there. And we had a few of these pieces of furniture. We still have the original 1917 drapes in the space, and um, some of the original paint on the trim. But again, you can kind of see that fabric paneling effect that used to go across the room. So you didn't have a 35 foot long wall with unbroken. You had this fabric paneled effect that sort of mirrors the paneling that's in the library and in the dining room just next to us. And of course, these big beautiful door surrounds which remain in place. Again, it had a piano historically. Agnes was an accomplished pianist um, and her daughter was also classically level trained as a pianist. Um, Mrs. Roth later on uh, was also heavy heavy musician, opera singer herself. And, and so the room historically had a lot of use as a music room, um, in addition to being a ladies' entertainment space. You can really see the details of the furniture throughout. You can see our beautiful light fixtures. These are all French Baccarat crystal um, from the Somme bags, which is still a premier atelier in Paris. Um, they also have offices here in the States. Um, and they still, I love this, the way that they write it on their website is that they still produce fine lighting for palaces, embassies, and fine hotels. So no surprise, they did almost all of the lighting throughout the house for the Bournes in 1917. One of these rare 1960s colorized views of the room show the furniture is almost identical during the Roth period. So remember that the Roths uh, purchased the house fully furnished from the estate of the Bournes. And while they had their own sale to kind of get rid of some items that didn't suit their taste in 1937, the bulk of the furniture and especially the art collection remained on site until their own auction in 1975 when we lost um, the huge majority of furnishings throughout the house. Um, Mrs. Roth, when she moved out, took key pieces with her and some of her family took pieces with her, um, with them, excuse me, um, to their own homes. And over time, those pieces have returned to us, but most of the pieces that we lost in the sale um, are still out in the world waiting to come home. So when I mentioned that we have an inventory, here's a couple of sheets from the inventory um, for this room. And you can sort of see it's, it tells you three pairs of draperies, uh, with valances of Damask. Uh, again, they're produced by Lennigan and Morant, who is a, a famous design company in New York um, and also in England. And they did all of our door surrounds. They also provided a lot of the draperies throughout the house. Um, any of the fine fittings, like the, uh, the paneling work and the columns and that beautiful detail on the main staircase, uh, the columns and things that you see in the ballroom are all by Lennigan and Morant. Um, you also see that they had a 16th century rug in the space, antique, uh, another smaller antique Shiraz rug um, on another part of the room, an even smaller one over in another corner of the room, some English mahogany armchairs, French Chippendale style. Um, they also had little side tables, carved ivory mandarin ornaments, ivory and teak wood stands for those. Um, other little carvings, a little onyx there of a young fisherman in ivory. They had this sort of detail for almost every room. Again, some rooms are a little light, um, but most of the rooms in this large binder are pretty detailed. And on the right, you can actually see one of the, the pages, um, a few pages down the road. This room is about 10 to 12 pages long in the inventory. Um, it actually tells you there was a stipple in colors of children at play by C.W. White, seven by eight in a gilt frame. Master Lambton, Mezzotint, a young lady encouraging the low comedian by Northcote, engraved by William Ward, Mezzotint, 1787, London, antique gold frame. So you can kind of see as the bank came through and they did an inventory, whenever they had details about something, they wrote it down pretty detailed. So what we ended up was when we talked about starting this room as a restoration project, we had this gold mine of information in that there's about 
30 different images of the room historically from different angles. And we also had this beautiful inventory that listed out all of the artwork that we were missing. And we could identify them in the photographs exactly where they hung and whether or not they were colored or a black uh, sepia tone and where different furniture was, how the room was, was accessorized. Uh, and so we, we had all this information. It was just really a matter of, well, how are we going to bring this project together? We started as we often do in the house um, with a grant that helped us pay for some lighting restoration. Um, starting in 2017, uh, we actually started working on a number of lighting projects throughout the house. And this was a part of our crystal light restoration project. And here's Matthew Shields, who did all of that beautiful work for us. And you can see a before on the left and an after of Matthew during final installation. And Matthew's this expert in rewiring and repinning with bronze wire every single crystal and every necklace of crystal prisms. Um, and he would come in and he took these down and every arm would be identified and he would trace out which crystals went on it in what order. And he did this for all of the crystal lights in the house, um, as well as the sconces. And the ballroom, you know, could take him a month, um, about a week and a half to un uninstall it, take all those crystals down and identify, wrap them each, then take them back to the shop, rewire the frame from start to bottom, then come back on site after he'd gotten every crystal ready at the shop, and then spend about a week and a half repinning and balancing the weight of it. And so he did that here in the drawing room as well, um, working on all of these beautiful sconces in the space, as well as the chandeliers. And the chandeliers had a little bit of an extra project to them. As you can see on the left, there was these large kind of copper bowls that had been added to the chandeliers. And again, since we had so many photographs of the room, I could confirm that these bowls were sort of added in the late 60s. And it was because there was little tiny lights that were added into them and they were supposed to increase the amount of illumination in the room but they actually sort of burned out and they were removed in the early national trust period from about 1975 to now they were removed in our early years because they were kind of a fire hazard um, and so they hadn't been used and so these these rather unsightly copper bowls um, just really didn't fit the beautiful profile of the chandeliers. They looked like big dark saucers from below. Um, these are beautiful, beautiful French chandeliers that are actually four times dipped in solid gold. So when you have something that's brass, no matter how shiny that brass is, next to beautiful gold, it just doesn't suit. So what we did was we actually removed those and we had to have little bobesh made um, to replace the ones that were missing, uh, those little cup holders underneath the candles. And we had to have those dipped. Um, I did not get to dip them four times in gold for cost saving measures, but we were able to match the finish exactly. Um, and they, they did actually have to be dipped, um, but to make them that beautiful color, it was the only way to match. Um, and when they were cleaned even, they had years of tobacco smoke and staining on them. So even the color of them, when he would wipe away kind of years of buildup, um, it was like Midas's gold. All of a sudden, all you saw was gleaming. So it was a really amazing project and we were able to restore the look and feel of those. So that was the first project that we did in here. Then we had um, a wonderful donor, um, Chris Keller, who's a member of my library and collections committee for many years and a longtime volunteer here helped and she stepped forward and helped us pay for not only the floors to be beautifully refinished throughout the space, but also some later upholstery work that you'll get to see. And again, this is a project where this is the second time in the modern era that the floors in this space have been refinished. In the early 1978 to about 1980, most of the first floor rooms were stripped of their dark stain. And as was fashionable at the time, you might remember that oak was all the rage in the 80s, especially light golden oak. And our beautiful smoked oak finish was just not in vogue. 
Um, and so in a, in a decision that we wouldn't necessarily make today from historic preservation, the floors were basically stripped of stain entirely and then just clear coated so that you were really just seeing this golden oak color. And the floors are a beautiful parquet pattern throughout. Um, they're all this beautiful inlay. And so what you really don't see is just how beautiful that pattern is when they're stripped of their stain. When you get the darker color, you get more variation and the pattern really comes to life. But it's, it's quite a large room. And so it's, it's always a bit of a project when the guys are doing things like sanding, we have to protect all of the wall coverings. We need to protect all of the light fixtures. Um, it also takes quite a lot of time on these hand inlaid floors to sand them and make sure that they're perfectly even because every single piece of wood is a different exposure on the grain. And that's why you get such beautiful patterning, but it's also quite tricky to sand. And so we work with really wonderful absolute flooring who does so many of our, our floor projects for us. Um, and they have a, a, a serious attention to detail and they've been wonderful to work with on our historic floors. Um, they've done a number of floors for us uh, in the last eight to nine years. And we knew from pictures that this room had, had this beautiful dark floor. And we also knew that there was two rooms in the house that had not been stripped in the 80s. And so the floor that you're seeing on the right is actually what today is sort of the Friends Library upstairs and the Sterling Library have their original floor finish. And so what you're seeing is a sample board there that we matched exactly to get that same golden oak color. And then they went through and they beautifully refinished the floor in this space. Um, and this is it during installation when we were starting to bring artwork and things like that back in. We also knew some of the original furniture had come back to us that was here in this space. Um, Mrs. Roth was one of our early first donors. And when she passed away in 1985, she actually left us a bequest of about 66 lots of furniture that had come out of Filoli that she'd taken with her to her next home in Hillsborough. And so some of the pieces like this beautiful Pierre Langlois commode on the left and a Florentine commode on the right, which is covered in sil silver gilt and then beautiful polychrome flowers painted on top of it as well as these lovely Chinese vases. Um, they all came back into the space from other places in the house that they had been historically displayed in sort of the modern era. They came back here into the room to go right back into their historical spots that we saw in photographs. Returning music to the room, authentic music to the room, um, I mentioned before that we kept a harpsichord and a square piano in the space because that was what we had in the collection already. And his, historically, Fedlili didn't have a harpsichord <laughs> or a square piano. Uh, the Borens had two beautiful late 19th century Steinway pianos, um, the best that you could buy at the time. Um, and so we were missing that element in the room. And in something that's become, um, it, it's really just fabulous luck. Uh, we sort of asked the universe uh, that we needed a Steinway. And the very next day, we had a cold call from a, a member of the community that said, hi, I have an 1896 Steinway that we would like to donate. And we were ecstatic and very happy to accept it. It had just been recently uh, beautifully restored and reworked. And so it was the perfect thing to come back into the space. And it was a wonderful donation by Patricia Nottingham who had actually met Mrs. Roth, and so she felt like she had a wonderful music connection to the space as well. And so we were able to remove the harpsichord and the square piano um, back upstairs into our storage space and bring this beautiful piano back into the room. And we've had volunteers and people for events that have enjoyed playing it. It's a beautiful instrument, it sounds wonderful. And it's just been a very different feel to have live music again available in this portion of the house. We also knew, of course, that we had those beautiful fuchsia sofas that Agnes and William chose for the middle of the room. And we were really looking at where we could reestablish that look. Are we gonna have to carve new couch frames? Um, I was looking at all sorts of used furniture, trying to find the right profile. And one of the Roth family members, Denny Bates, 
was walking through the house with me um, with a few of her friends and I told her that we were starting to think about a full restoration of this room. I um, mean, it's a room that the family agreed, you know, uh, could use more historical connection. You know, they always said it didn't feel like it used to. This was one of the only spaces that really sort of read differently to them from memory. And it was because so many of the items in this room were no longer here. And so Denny said, you know, I have a pair of sofas that grandma gave me that when she got married in the 70s, she took out a Filoli to give to her. And she said, I've reupholstered them into this tropical fabric because uh, she said they had a very mansion feel to them with the original upholstery that was there. And so she generously donated those back to us. And uh, with Chris's support, we were able to reupholster those. And we knew that they were the same fuchsia as the sofas in the reception room, which is the one that you're seeing there on the left. And we also knew that when Mrs. Roth had those reupholstered, she had retained extra fabric. And when she gave us the sofas in 1985, um, she also gave the extra fabric from when those were upholstered. And so I had this bolt of 36 yards of historic damask that was a perfect fit. And whenever I went looking for fabric, I could never get damask that was the right color. I could get close to the pattern, but it really needed to be that fuchsia. And I took all sorts of measurements and I worked with our upholster um, in San Carlos. And I said, how much do you need to do these two six foot sofas? And he said, I need about 35 yards. I said, well, I've got 36 yards. He said, well, that might be cutting it a little close. And I said, well, you can't find out that you're short. So we sort of cheated and, and you can sort of see these pink fabrics on the right. Are, I did the underside of the cushions in a different fabric to make sure that he had exactly enough fabric to do all of the detail work on them. Um, and I had him split the cushions again down the middle and do detail on the arms with a beautiful rolled edge and sort of a spiral design um, that's very reminiscent of what's in the reception room. So we totally changed the look back to that very mansion feel of those sofas. The other big missing item, of course, was the mezzotints. So there was this amazing collection of roughly 40 mezzotints, aquatints, and a selection of stipple engravings that Agnes Bourne had chosen for the room. And they were missing. They had sold largely in the 1975 Bonhams auction that was held on site before Mrs. Roth really knew that she was going to donate the property. She had this four day auction, most of the art and furniture, all of which she didn't take with her to Hillsborough sold. So we knew we didn't have it. And we had an amazing donor, Brad Parberry of Cavallini Papers, step forward and say he was interested in helping us restore this really important piece of this room. And we started working together the week of Christmas in December of 2018. And I shared with him that inventory that I showed you earlier. And we started hunting the world <laughs> on auctions and uh, dealers and through his work he had a number of connections with a lot of people we sent out wish lists we um, we just we did our very best to try to find all 40 and we have found 37 to date um, and then Brad allowed me to purchase about five extra prints um, that filled in some of the gaps and so what we were looking for was who did Agnes collect we had that beautiful list. It told us the artist, the title, the engraver, what date it was. It often told us whether or not it was hand colored, but again, we had photographs that showed us when they were colored and when they weren't. And whenever possible, when we were hunting for these wonderful images, Brad and I tried to find the best available and the, the closest to what was here historically. We both had a similar eye that we wanted them to be in beautiful condition, but we didn't want them to be perfect necessarily. They should look like they've been here for the last 102 years, but mezzotints, aquatints, and, and stipple engravings are 17th, 18th, and 19th century objects. So we also both strongly felt that they shouldn't look like they're bleached and brand new. They should look like they have a little bit of age on them, 
but we both really wanted to make sure that the color was still readable. So we worked with uh, some paper conservators in Florence, Italy, as, um, as well as locally, to work on these to make sure that sometimes if something needed cleaning or mending, it was done, but that it wasn't done, it wasn't overdone. <laughs> we really wanted to make sure that these were beautiful um, and readable and had the same look and feel as when Agnes would have been collecting them. Now, mesotints uh, were invented in the 17th century in Holland, but the English adored them and really jumped on them like no, no other and really ran with it as, as a collectible. So think of these as sort of the poster collectible of the day. And they, they remain in fashion, especially for art collectors through the 19th century until they're replaced by photographs. So it was really one technology replacing the other. And mesotints are, are you know, done by engraving an image onto a copper plate. And every pit mark and mark that you make with a stylus onto the copper plate is where ink is gonna be held. And then when you print against that plate, the ink capacity based on, on your marks is what gives you depth of color. And then they would often go in and hand color these after, after the fact. Um, Aquatints uh, are invented in the 18th century in France, and it's a similar process except for an acid bath is used to etch the plate um, instead of only a tool being used. And then stipple engravings are an 18th century English invention, and they are a combination of etching and engraving. Again, uh, using a copper bath or copper plate and a, a, an acid bath at the end. And so those could be printed in color or they could be printed in sepia kind of tones and uh, then hand colored. So we have a little bit of all of those in the room and they have levels. You know, you could have multiple printings um, off of one copper plate. And so earlier ones tend to be clearer and easier to read. Later tend to be a little bit harder to read. Um, this is actually our, our donor's favorite. Um, this is uh, his absolute favorite. We haven't gotten to my favorite yet. <laughs> but what comes across in this collection and what really came across when they started to arrive in bulk, as you saw, and I had them stretched out in one of the upstairs bedrooms and I was sort of checking them in and starting to align them on various spaces uh, upstairs with big notes, you know, below them that was like, this is the west wall, this is the east wall, this is, you know, either side of the fireplace. Um, is people started to come upstairs, our, our CEO, Karen Newport, Brad would come and see them um, unpacked and, and spread out and next to each other and instead of one at a time, is that we really started to see Agnes and her role as a collector in these. And I hope that as you're kind of, you know, flipping through these, you're sort of seeing that Agnes chose to surround herself and her ladies with beauty and images of women and children in this kind of bucolic moment. Uh, ladies in beautiful gowns, ladies in gardens. Mesotints and simple engravings and things are based on original paintings. And she chose artists that were incredibly popular, uh, that are still household names. Um, Angelica Kaufman, George Moreland, George Romney, William Hamilton, Sir Thomas Lawrence, Sir Joshua Reynolds, John Hopner, Jay Burke. Um, you know, she, she chose these really beautiful images when if you look at mesotints on a whole, today the ones that are most available tend to be military and more masculine. Um, and so you really sort of have to hunt for these scenes. Um, some of them might be sort of tawdry, a little naughty, um, tends to also be very popular, especially in French mesotints. Um, so in pieces like this with Red Boy, you know, uh, she chose these just really beautiful images. And so looking at the space, sometimes we had the choice of two. So on that inventory, you may have noticed earlier, Red Boy didn't list an, an engraver. And 
if you do even a simple Google search for Red Boy, I think everyone who copies this period of art, everyone did a mezzotint historically of Red Boy. So there was a glut of them on the market and we were trying to figure out which one. And you can see up in here in these two faces, two different engravers looking at the paintings have two different feels compared to the painting, compared to somebody. The, the tiniest mark with your stylus can change the shape of a nose or the depth of the rock or what the plant looks like next to them. You just, you can gain or lose that information very, very quickly. And so sometimes in a few instances, we had to really kind of pick, well, which of the ones available do we move forward with? And this is actually my favorite. This is called um, Wood Nymph, uh, out collecting firewood. So as we, as we came through, we collected these. And then again, because of Brad's generosity and his connections in Italy, we were able to work with uh, the studio shop of Giovanni Bacani, and they created these beautiful hand-carved traditional frames and French-style hand-painted mats for all of the pieces throughout the room. And I created kind of framing sheets that we sent to Italy, um, uh, showing them what the art would look like, what the measurements were, how many centimeters I, I wanted each mat to be, and I included a picture of what the historical picture looked like um, on the wall here. And then we chose frames based on their likability to those historical examples. And then it was hanging time when they all arrived. And you can see I used giant craft paper. Um, Ellie, uh, my curatorial specialist and I, we created all of these outlines. Ellie cut all of these exactly to the size of all of the frames so that we could see what the spacing was gonna look like. And this room, again, we have 17 and a half foot ceilings and the artwork itself is quite large in scale. And you can sort of see that Agnes hung the original room all the way completely even in the historic photos on the upper tier. She handled that whole room is centered kind of waterline style, which is exactly how we hang studio uh, and exhibit shows now. She hung the whole original series that way. And then you can kind of see that as a collector, she couldn't stop. And she started layering other pieces below them down lower. And so those end up being hung differently than the upper tier. And so we really wanted to make sure that the spacing was correct. We wanted to make sure that everything was even. And so this is the easiest way to do that. And so uh, there I am hanging and with my handy laser level using all the technology available to me. Today, you can see that we had a number for each one so that we know exactly where they were gonna be. And then we just moved our way all the way around the room, uh, finding each piece and hanging it back in its historical spot. So now the final phase of the room is the wall coverings. So a little over a year ago, we hung all of the art as it had arrived. And we knew that the final phase was going to be restoring that beautiful pale yellow wall coverings that were here all the way until 2000. So the, the walls were reupholstered for the first time in 1978, um, right when the house was getting ready to open to the public. And they had big outlines and shadow burn marks from light damage as to where all of those mesotins had been. So it was necessary to reupholster the walls but they were able to match this fabric, which is a sample that you're seeing here, almost exactly um, in 1978. And then in 2000, when they went to do it again, they found that they couldn't get that yellow color anymore, but they could get this color in the same fabric. So we ended up with sort of a green color. And I honestly think it's something as simple as the two order forms. I pulled, I pulled them from our archives and they have identical part numbers. And so I almost wonder in 2000, if they said, well, in 1978, we ordered from this company and this was the part number. In 2000, they went to them and they said, well, we ordered from you last time, here's the part number. We need 300 yards of fabric. And I sort of wonder how long it was before someone realized that the part number may have changed and it was no longer the same color. We don't know, <laughs> but there's a note from my predecessor, Tom Rogers, um, who was here you know, for almost 32 years that says it's coming and it's not the right color <laughs> and it's not the right width. 
So in 2000, they were only able to get 54 inch fabric and the original fabric was a larger, wider. And so they had to take down some of the gimp work, that beautiful outline uh, around the room that covers basically your staple marks from the upholstery being stretched over the walls. And it also used to cover all of the sewn seams. But suddenly at 54 inches, there was gonna be seams kind of willy nilly throughout the space instead of their beautiful original standardized layout. And so what Tom's note said is that they didn't have enough of the gimp to do it. And they didn't want to have exposed seams and kind of fake it. So they decided to just outline the edges of the room and remove that element. And that really broke up the space like we saw earlier. When you don't have this trim throughout, you really miss some of that detailing of the room. And this was the trim that was put on in 1917. It was reused again in 78, and then part of it was reinstalled in 2000. And so we knew we needed to match the original color again, and we needed to get enough of this trim. Almost 300 yards are needed to do the whole room properly. So we started hunting. I spent months hunting. Um, I put out feelers to expand the search. And Brad actually, again, came to our rescue and had some connections. And we were able to have both the fabric and the trim just arrived during quarantine. <laughs> They've been custom woven for us and have just literally arrived last week, 300 yards of the trim arrived. So now this is what the room looks like today. But by the end of September, I hope that the room will be pale yellow again and beautifully paneled throughout with our lovely trim and that all of this art will be reinstalled. And now you know what the end of my August looks like because I will be taking down each of these paintings or each of these mezzotints again and carefully stowing all of the small decorative items um, while the house is closed. Uh, so that's one good thing about this moment in time is that I, I don't need to worry about guests coming through or how to reroute them, at least for this time period. Um, we'll be able to move furniture out, but not necessarily all the way upstairs into storage and work on getting this lovely room to once again be pale yellow and have that brightness that will really show what the room was like historically. And then we'll, we'll be ready to move on to our next room, which is the gentleman's lounge, which is a future talk in another project. So right now the garden and the estate trail are both open. Um, we still recommend that you, you know, come and enjoy. You just have to make sure to reserve your tickets in advance. You can do that online and then bring comfortable shoes, water, a mask, and a little social distance. But it's a beautiful, beautiful time to get out of our homes a little bit and still spread out in the garden here and enjoy the beauty of nature and the beauty of Filoli. The estate trail is a lovely one mile loop that you can go on. It's a one way loop. Um, so you're able to socially distance and spread out, out there as well. And of course, with 16 acres of formal garden, um, it's actually quite easy to spread out and find a little bit of space to enjoy the garden. And the summer garden is absolutely stunning right now. And especially on Thursday evenings, it's wonderful. We're open till eight o'clock on those evenings and you can grab a drink and a little bite to eat um, and then enjoy a moment in the garden. If you're still staying home and you're not quite ready to venture out, you can visit us virtually. And we have a lot of content that we've been making throughout this whole period um, with Instagram and YouTube, Facebook. We also have this visit virtual page where you can get to all of those links and be able to join us here, hear talks from myself or from our director of horticulture, Jim Salyards, or maybe catch a little bit of our nature education with Marianne and really be able to experience by Loli, um, even from your own home. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm thinking that you might have some questions that have popped up that Tom can uh, ask me. Yes, we do. <laughs> um, so a couple of questions. One, were all the floors in the house the smoked oak? 
Yeah, so originally it looks like all of the floors um, throughout were smoked oak. That's what the pictures look like. And if you're looking for something to watch at home during the shelter in place, if you watch um, Heaven Can Wait with Warren Beatty um, in 1978, it's a really early view of the house because it was the first movie that was filmed on site. And as you watch the film, you'll see all these beautiful dark floors throughout. <laughs> and then a couple other questions here. Um, one, are all the draperies original? And if not, have they had work done? Oh yeah. So we were fortunate and it's, it's actually very rare in a historic house setting like this to still have your original draperies and the dining room, drawing room, the reception room, the library are second generation. They're Roth period, not born period, um, but they're family era. And then the study Mrs. Roth had installed right at the end of their period here. And then the ballroom are also original to the born period. And then we have a few others that are sort of in that late Roth period upstairs that are in some of the bedroom spaces. But the ones upstairs, because they haven't had the same window film, uh, we have a UV film coating on every pane of glass on the first floor. And we, it's, there's thousands of panes of this UV film that gets put on the windows. We started doing that in the early 1980s and that helps block some of the ultraviolet and infrared that comes through from sunlight that damages objects. And so we have that film on almost all of the windows on the first floor and on some of the windows on the second floor, but the bedrooms upstairs that haven't had that film for the last 45 years, some of the silk drapes that were sort of up there that weren't in great shape at the end of the Roth period are pretty shattered now. And we've basically taken those down. I, I usually cut out like a whole sample of the pattern and we take really detailed measurements and photographs and detailed drawings of like what the pleating style was and we save any hardware when those get retired. Um, but the ones down here have actually had some as many as two different campaigns of heavy conservation work in the last 45 years. So the first patterns, we sort of had a conservator on site in the, I wanna say it was about 1985 that the first round happened throughout the house. And they actually worked on all these historic drapes. They relined them, uh, gave new muslin, a sort of a sacrificial lamb on the backside of it that could take any light damage that was gonna happen and replace what had been there and make some repairs. And then we're starting a, another campaign in some rooms uh, for the last three years, maybe four years now, we've been working on the reception room drapes and those are going through full restoration work and a lot of repairs to splits and tears. And then uh, those are a, a treadle loom chenille with a gold thread. They're exquisite pieces of fabric. And then all of the trim detail on them is actually in the traditional French fashion done on these machines that honestly make like a meter a day and they're still bicycle driven. Um, those trims are incredibly delicate and a lot of them are made out of silk thread and so they're pretty friable and so they split and, and kind of break easily. And so often our conservators will take new silk thread and kind of give them new seat belt anchors to hold them on and restore some of the color to them. And so each of those drapes can take as little as four months of hand sewing and as long as six to seven months of hand sewing to repair. So we're on the last panel right now. So if you've come through in the last few months, you may have noticed that we're missing one of the panels, but all of the valances have been done and all of the other panels have been done. And when they come back, they're almost three inches shorter and they don't have any splits or tears anywhere and they really stand up very straight and uh, ready for their next 100 years. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I was wondering if you, people were wondering if you could maybe, if you're on your iPad, if you could kind of walk around and show some other aspects of the room. That's what's sort of fun about having these uh, tablets to do it with. So I'm gonna take you on a walk about here. <laughs> I will try to go slowly so as not to make you a little motion sick. So here on the dining room side, I can sort of show you, here's 
our new trim uh, fragment that just arrived. So you can see the historic one along the door there. And this is the newly woven pattern. And we were sort of hanging it on the back of this uh, art right now to kind of show in the pictures, that's right where the first one is. So they were about 64 to 74 inches apart. And some of the pieces, like this is Miss Ferran. This is uh, Brad's favorite piece. He just, he loves her whole outfit. Um, and she's so very proper. And there's great stories about each of these. Um, you can see those beautiful mats. So they actually kind of watercolor in those inset detail. And then some of them have a gilt detail, like uh, juvenile retirement here has a beautiful bold gilt uh, page applied. So these French style mats um, are really beautiful in their own room, in addition to the exquisite artwork. And I do love La Rose here was one that was really tricky to find. Um, and Brad kept looking and I kept looking and it was a part of a set with one called La Main, which is right here nearby. And they're both these lovers and gardens, um, lovely, lovely scenes, very romantic. And we have now three of these because Brad kept finding one that he liked better, <laughs> that I couldn't disagree was in better shape. So we've collected a number of these. And so we'll use those for educational purposes and to kind of talk about them where we couldn't find things um, that were an exact match. So here, I looked at those historic images of what Agnes kind of kept on the mantelpiece. And what she had was a lot of her white uh, china with just this kind of bisque uh, finish on it, her Blanchine porcelain. And a lot of it is French soft paste porcelain, very early. We didn't have her exact pieces, but we have a really extensive collection of French soft paste porcelain on site. So what I did was wherever I couldn't match something that she had exactly, I tried to get as close as we could in our existing collection um, to show that. So here on the, the side table, we have another example. In the pictures, historically, Agnes had a lovely bronze satyr that was here on the side table. And so I had a pan figure, another satyr um, in bronze, but slightly different, but they're the same size, they're the same material. So I tried to get as close as possible whenever I could. We also had some lamps made um, to match ones that were in the room. And again, Matthew Shields made those beautiful lamps for us and rewired everything. Um, and then we tried to choose pieces of furniture that were a fit again for what was here. So like this candle stand in the corner is very reminiscent of the candle stand that the, the Bournes had in the corner of the room. There are a few things that are a little different. One of them, like this beautiful piece, um, is a new donation that just arrived actually. And the original cabinet that was here on this wall is currently on display at the Legion of Honor. And it's a part of their permanent collection. Mrs. Roth actually gave it to them um, at the time of her death. It was originally supposed to come to Filoli and she ended up, she was also on the board of directors for the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. And at the last minute, it disappears from our inventory and it ends up on their inventory. So I can, I can confirm that that Pierre Langlois commode is, is never gonna come home to Filoli. So what we needed to do was find another beautiful cabinet uh, that would be able to take its place. And this beautiful piece was offered um, to us just at the start of this year. And it was uh, a longtime family uh, connected with Filoli and we were able to fit this piece in. And it was, it was beautiful. It had fittings very reminiscent of the Pierre Langlois commodes uh, that the room originally had. It had this beautiful nature theme. So we thought Agnes might approve of this one. And you can see, I didn't even have to change the artwork above it. It could not be a better fit um, for the space. So, <laughs> and it was also very narrow and being another beautiful dark finish, it fit in very well with the piano. And you can see these beautiful semi-precious stones 
um, that are actually applied to the front of the piece as well as these beautiful ormolu, which is gilt bronze fittings throughout. And so this, this beautiful French piece, which is late 19th century, um, was a beautiful fit for the room. And again, we really wanna show you know, the piano and talk about music in the room. So we even have a JJ Paderowski who actually performed here in the ballroom for the Borns. We have a piece of his music out on, on the table. And pieces are kind of continuing to come in during quarantine, uh, during shelter in place, these beautiful end tables came home to Filoli. So these actually are original to the room. There's a pair, there's a pair of them. They're, they're not actually a fixed pair, but they are near identical. One, this one uh, that we're looking at right now is slightly larger and has a little bit different decorative trim on its tripod base. But Mrs. Roth had them in the room. Uh, Agnes Bourne had them in the room. And Mrs. Roth's daughter, Lurleen Coonan, claimed them in the 70s. And so uh, one of my last conversations with Mrs. Coonan, actually, before she passed away a few years ago, was about these tables and the possibility that they might eventually make their way home to Filoli. And her son, Jim Coonan, gave them uh, to us just earlier this year. So pieces continue to kind of come home to Filoli. So that's been a really amazing thing to have happen. Um, and it's great to have them back because I really didn't have another table that fit exactly. They, they just weren't the same scale. So here you can see uh, this beautiful sofa. There's a pair of them. I love, I told the guy, um, our upholsterer, I said, well, you know, they're, they're sort of love seats. And he goes, truly, they're six feet long, they're sofas. I said, yeah, but all my other sofas are nine or 10 feet, so they feel really small. <laughs> so, but you can see, uh, they don't look like they're tropical anymore. Um, you can see how I had them split the seats and do down pillow inserts. Um, down pillows are just not done to the same level today. It's, it's always sort of frustrating um, when you're working with the upholsters. I'm like, no, no, like down pillows, like filled with, with only feather, like just down feathers. And they're like, well, we do a down insert now. And I'm like, mm, it's not the same thing. It, it, it doesn't have the same poofiness that you see on the other sofas. But this is where I detailed exactly how I wanted the arms to look. So you might remember from those earlier pictures, they were really just kind of smooth 1960s. Um, all that detailing had been removed. And then I even had to hunt down a trim that I really liked. Um, so trying to make sure that we got the right color and the right scale was also quite tricky. Um, so these are the little side projects that uh, I actually adore and can be incredible time sinks, but really rewarding when you get to see uh, the sofas back in their spot. Do we have any other questions, Tom, that I can point out? Um, the only other question that we had here was regarding the the manufacture of the chandelier and the sconces. Oh yeah. So here you, you can sort of see one of them, one of the chandeliers up top here, um, as well as, as the beautiful sconces. Um, so there's four sconces in the room. They're about three feet tall. The chandeliers are roughly 50, 55 inches tall. Um, they're a lot narrower. They're one of the smaller crystal chandeliers in the house, um, only being about three and a half feet wide. The, the chandeliers, by comparison, in the ballroom are almost seven feet tall and, and almost 60 inches wide. So um, <laughs> these, are, these are always a faster dusting. Um, they are made by Maison Bags in Paris. And they were made uh, originally for Bourne's custom house. Um, and they, they still, they have an office in Beverly Hills. Um, they were actually quite funny because I called them and said, we wanted to do some restoration work. And they, they basically said that they don't do uh, restoration work and they don't have parts available for restoration work. 
because I was looking for those. We needed, you know, uh, I think it was 14 Bobesh. So I said, well, can I look through the catalog? If, if there's another chandelier that is still in production, maybe I can get a similar piece. And nothing was quite exactly right. Uh, we ended up finding something through one of Matthew's uh, connections. And then again, like I said, we had to have them dipped to match the finish. But it was, it was sort of amusing because I said, well, how do you, you know, what happens when one of your clients needs, needs them repaired? And they said, oh, they, they just buy a new one. And I said, well, mine are over 100 years old. I don't want to buy a new one. <laughs> I also don't have the funding to buy a new one. <laughs> I'm quite fond of the historic ones. So, but yeah, they're, they're exquisite. And they did almost all of the lights throughout the house. Um, and we know that because we'll often see their B um, stamped into the metalwork on the frames. So we, we know that that's their hallmark um, and we can always identify their pieces as well as most of the sconces and things throughout the house are very similar to pieces that they have in production today on their website. Um, and you can, you can see that like it's 90% the same and then maybe just a little bit different in one detail. And so they're often using their historic archives, uh, which they've been keeping since the 1860s, I believe. Um, to do their drawings and they do these beautiful gilt bronze uh, fittings still on many of their their light fixtures they still make them traditionally the same way that they have been for the last 150 plus years well Julie I just want to thank you again for finding the time to to share with us this amazing endeavor um, that you have there in this incredible treasure right in our own backyard here. We're fortunate enough to live so close. So uh, once again, um, I just can't thank you uh, enough for taking the, the time out of your incredibly busy schedule, just trying to find things to put back in their place. So um, please uh, accept our great appreciation for all the work that you and the rest of the Fioli staff are doing to help preserve this national treasure. Oh yeah, I definitely couldn't do it alone without the support of our facilities department, our interpretation team that helps tell the stories um, in the room as well, um, as all of our development team that worked with over 50 donors to make this project possible, um, the National Trust for Historic Preservation for helping pay for some of the restoration work as well. Um, without Brad helping recreate this collection, the room would still look like sort of a fancy hallway. It just doesn't have the same feel as it does when it has all the artwork. So thank you for Woodside Arts and Culture um, helping us share this, this story and being a, a supportive neighbor through all of this. Okay, well remember um, everyone that Fawili is open and you can visit and it's a great way to support uh, Julie and the staff to continue to build upon the foundation they've laid there. So um, thank you. I want to remind all of you that next month we have someone who's going to take us to the far north. Leslie Fields will be talking about the Arctic and her projects there to help uh, preserve. And thank you all for joining us. And you know, it's just amazing when you think about the wealth that was involved in the original planning and constructing of Violi. And so, so I'd like to end with a quote from Andrew Carnegie, who said that surplus wealth is a sacred trust, which its predecessor is bound to administer in his lifetime for the good of the community. Mm -hmm. And we can certainly thank Mrs. Roth and the National Trust to make sure that the wealth that is this treasure of Fioli has been continuing to be a part of our community and be a wonderful place to visit. So thank you all and I hope you stay safe and healthy and we'll see you next month for another exciting First Friday event sponsored by the Woodside Arts and Culture Community. Thank you. Good night.
Thank you, Julie. It was wonderful. Oh, thank you, Crane. <laughs> you had a couple of comments saying uh, that that uh, they were wondering where the mezzotints, where you actually purchased them. Oh yeah. Um, we had kind of every auction imaginable. Um, you know, some some of them were in the UK. Some of them were here in the states. A lot a lot of them were in the UK though. Um, a, different houses do online some of them you could even find on places like ebay um, especially some of the smaller ones um, but through a lot of online dealers uh, but you have to often ask them and send them inventories because they have such a glut of inventory that they they don't often show all of them online so you have to sort of know what you're asking for and then reach out to them and say, so you have this one, do you by chance have this one or this one? Yeah. yeah. Good, well, thank you for that. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much, you were wonderful. Thanks, good to see you. <laughs>